Our preaching schedule has been a little bit uh, undulating over the last few weeks. I had committed to preaching through Hebrews on Sunday evening, but then we had a Guatemala trip report, and then we had a patriotic celebration, and I decided just to move Hebrews to Sunday morning church. And as I realized what passages were going to fall in these two Sundays, I realized, well, this is not a bad thing, because I figured out that you needed to hear this. So here we are in Hebrews on Sunday morning with this title, Hard Question. And there are a lot of hard questions in life that we are prompted to answer. Some of them are philosophical, prompted by some sanctified navel-gazing. Who am I, anyway? Why am I here? You get down the road of peace and you start examining your life and you ask, have I really done anything that matters? When you're trying to define success, you might ask, have I been successful? You get to a place sometimes where you feel like you're not making any progress, you're in a bad relationship, in a bad job, and in a bad place in life, and you might ask, am I stuck, just stuck, without the ability to continue to move forward? Well, I don't intend to deal with any of those questions this morning, because I feel like the passage of Scripture gives us a really good one to chew on a little bit as a group of people who would gather in a church on Sunday morning at 1045 a.m.? It's a hard question. Hebrews chapter 6, the first eight verses, is the setting for the question. Let me read it, and then we'll come back to the introduction for a moment. The author wrote, Therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith toward God, of instruction about washings and laying on of hands, and the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And this we will do if God permits. For in the case of those who have once been enlightened and have tasted of the heavenly gift and have been made partakers of the Holy Spirit and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the age to come and then have fallen away, it is impossible to renew them again to repentance since they again crucify to themselves the Son of God and put Him to open shame. For ground that drinks the rain which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it's also tilled receives a blessing from God. But if it yields thorns and thistles, it's worthless and close to being cursed and it ends up being burned. So I think the author of Hebrews brings us to this place and frames a very difficult question that had a particular application for them at that moment. You know, that's the way Scripture works. Uh, written, given by God, inspired by the Holy Spirit for a group of people at a particular place in time. There's always an application for then and there. But the, the way the living Word of God works, as He gave it to them, he, he gave it knowing that it would have an extended application, not only for them then and there, but for us here and now. And that's the beauty of and the power of the living Word of God. And so there was application for them. We'll explore that a little bit, but then there's also an extended application for us. And I believe it asks the question, can a Christian lose their salvation? Is it possible for somebody to have made a decision to, in faith, receive Christ, get down the road a little piece and change their mind? There have been some famous artists, musicians, Christian musicians, Christian actors and actresses who said that although they had come to faith in Christ early in their life, as they had had their eyes open like a puppy, they'd realized that there was no truth in that. There was nothing that could sustain them. And so they were renouncing or walking away from their faith. Well, we know that if a famous musician or a Hollywood actress says it, it's got to be the truth. So that confuses a lot of people. Is it possible to lose your salvation? Or is there something that we could do, a sin so heinous, a sin so evil that God would say, you're out? There are those who take these verses and build a case for that. Uh, I'm, I'm going to build a case as well this morning. And I'm not going to do it with fear and trepidation that I think I'm wrong and I, I hope you'll agree with me and my opinion I'm going to preach with a degree of confidence, a strong degree of confidence, because I believe 
that the Bible teaches very clearly what I'm going to share with you today. I believe very confidently that what I'm going to share with you is God's truth. There are those that disagree with me. You can find commentaries that will disagree with me, and they are free to do that. And there are those who agree with me, and, and I think they're the better commentaries. But anyway, I, I, will, uh, I will share with you what I have gained from this passage of Scripture. You've listened to me read it. I think there are three movements in the passage. The first one is this. A commitment to Christ, to say yes in faith to Christ, is a commitment to press on to maturity. As opposed to uh, just a a whim, a decision that I made in a moment of emotion or weakness. I said, yes, sign me up. Uh, But then I backed off from that. A commitment to Christ, and, and listen to his language in just a moment. A commitment to Christ is a commitment to press on to maturity. The author of Hebrews called on believers to not settle for something less than what God intended for them, but to stretch themselves, to do their part in response to what God has already done that he alone is able to do from his side. He began, therefore, leaving the elementary teaching about the Christ, let us press on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of, and he gave all those things in there that that sound Good, and, and they are. Because he wasn't saying at all that I want you to renounce these things and to embrace a new set of truth. But I want you to press on. I want you to stretch yourselves toward maturity and build on this foundation. I want you to take what you've been given, what has been taught to you, and, and let that be a, a foundation, if you will. And let's, let's go up from there. But let's go up. Let's continue. Let's, let's press on. Let's move forward. And I think there are two applications here. First, admittedly, in that congregation, there were those who, who did nothing more than talk about their religion. They had endless conversations about religious activity and religious opinions. They were soaked through and through in the traditions and rituals of their Jewish religion. Not a bad religion, but they had come to accept their religion as the be-all and end-all. This is as good as it gets. This is all I need. And so when they heard about Christ, they, they heard the, the message of Christ. They heard the message of salvation. They, they saw the conviction in the lives of some who were around them. And the next point is going to e- elaborate on that. But there wasn't enough in what they saw, enough in what they heard to make them take the next, sto- next step forward. They just settled in where they were. The author challenged them to move on, to press on to faith. Granted, we all know this, salvation has an instantaneous effect. When one, whether they're seven or 97, when one comes to faith in Jesus Christ and, and realizes our need of a Savior, realize that we're lost and without Him we're headed toward hell and eternal separation from God, but realize that He loved us and, and that He gave his son's life on Calvary's cross so that our sin could be forgiven and we could have eternal life, which is both here and in the, in the hereafter. And so we, in childlike faith, and that's all we can do is receive what God has provided through his son, Jesus Christ. And I, I'm convinced at that very moment, at that moment, in that instant, our names are written down in the Lamb's book of life. Hypothetical. Let's say that you know, a child on Thursday night at home prays with mom and dad, and they've been persistent. They're ready. And, and they say, I, I want Jesus. I want Jesus in my heart. I need Jesus in my heart. I don't want to live or die without Jesus. And mom and dad relent because we're nervous about a seven-year-old. We want to make sure they know what they're doing. This child is, is unrelenting in their persistence. I, I'm lost. I, I'm a sinner. I want to be saved. And they pray. It's not the prayer that saves them. It's Christ who saves them. And in faith, they receive the gift of eternal life through Jesus Christ. And on Thursday night, from our perspective, in that moment, their names are written down in the Lamb's Book of Life. Hypothetically, in the middle of the night, something horrible happens. And that child dies. My conviction is that that child wakes up in heaven. Stands before the Lord, and there is their name in the Lamb's Book of Life. There is an instantaneous effect of salvation. But y'all, that's not the end. 
That's the beginning. That's just the start. And, and that's what this author is, is prompting this group to consider and, and to apply. Salvation does have an instantaneous effect, but it leads to a lifelong process of sanctification, of growing up in the reality of that salvation experience, of, of receiving what it means and then appropriating, applying what it means as we grow up. The stronger we grow spiritually, the more we're able to apply. The broader our understanding of Christ becomes, the broader our ability is to experience the abundant life. And his, his encouragement was, hey, press on. Press on toward that. Don't be satisfied with a church, a religion, a dogma, a ritual. Don't allow that to get in your way of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Press on toward that. But I think there's a second application. I think there were those who had professed faith in Christ. But for some irrational reason, they'd been stymied in their spiritual growth. Mired in conversations that were elementary. They kept circling back to the same infantile spiritual questions. They kept going back to the same things that had been covered again and again and again. And so it was time for them to move on in their spiritual development. Parents, some of you have done this, some of you think it's cute, but, you know, when your child is, is first learning to talk, you, you remember when you prayed, dear God, please help my child learn how to talk. Six months later, dear God, please help my child shut up. <laughs> Those two come real close to each other. But early on, this child talks with baby talk, and it's, oh, listen to it. And they mess up their words, and they jabber a little bit. Oh, isn't that so sweet? But when you got a 13-year-old, who's still talking like they did when they first learned to talk at two, y'all, that's embarrassing. We'll say to them, use your words. Quit talking like a baby. The author of Hebrews said, hey, it's time for you to stop talking like a baby. Let's talk like somebody who has known Christ and is growing up in Christ and, and press on toward maturity. Institutional religion, our churches can oftentimes provide a hiding place. For individuals who are more enamored with religion than with Christ. I mean, we, we have a, a Christian heritage. We have a Christian influence in our nation. And so for some, it is a, a natural thing. That's not a really good word. It, it's a natural thing to, to find religion, to find a church, to go to church, sing the songs, quote the verses, engage in the liturgy, but stay a long way away from Christ. I'm satisfied with the religion. But Christ died to give us life, not just religion. And our religious activity, I'm not suggesting for a moment that what we do in terms of worship and Bible study and our ministries, I'm not suggesting that's bad and we ought to replace it with something more, more appropriate. It is appropriate, but it ought, to, it ought to erupt out of a relationship with Jesus Christ and it shouldn't be the, the end in itself. Our religious activity should be an outgrowth of our faith in Jesus Christ. Church can also foster the belief that spiritual maturity is for the few. You believe, you know, well, there's a few people in our church that really have it together, that are really spiritual giants. But for the rest of us, we're going to have our, our spiritual training wheels on until we die. You know, as long as we can get John 3.16 out in some fashion, as long as I can remember the first verse to Amazing Grace, I'm good. Don't mess with me about those hard words, the four-syllable ones. I, I'm good. Don't, don't, don't sell yourself short and don't swallow that lie. All God's children have the capability of growing up into Christ. And the Christian life is a transformative experience. You don't get it all in one fell swoop. We grow up in Christ. We press on toward maturity in Christ. It takes us from where we were in our sin to where we can be in Jesus Christ. So, a commitment to Christ is a commitment to press on to maturity. That's the foundation that he's going to lay. But then he gets to the hard part of this passage. The second point, a casual experience of religion can be a barrier to salvation. For in the case of those who have once been, and then he starts laying out all these experiences that they've had, and they sound good. They got so close. Uh, they may have experienced religion in a way that was attractive. They, they may have heard the message in such a way that it was convicting. Maybe you've been there, maybe you haven't. But you get caught up in a moment and there is a, a euphoria, there is a, 
uh, an emotional catharsis. Uh, if you're prone to, to cry, to weep, you may have had one of those moments where you actually shed a tear and went, wow, I don't know what just happened, but I, I don't usually cry, but I cried in church this morning. Or, or maybe there was just this profound, whoo, that was so good. My goodness, it must have been the Lord. Well, I hope, but not necessarily. They got close. They had these experiences. They got these glimpses of what could be, but they stopped. They stopped short of faith. They stopped short of trust. They stopped short of a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. They stopped short. I, I want to assure you that the author of Hebrews is not suggesting the possibility of losing one's salvation. The passage this passage has to be said in the context of the entire book of Hebrews. And that's just a good word about biblical interpretation and, and Bible study. Please do not take a phrase or a verse out of its context and build your religious argument on that phrase or that verse. That is very poor stewardship of the word. Uh, get the context of the paragraph, get the context of the, of the section, get the context of the book, and then set it in the context of the New Testament, set it in the context of the entire Bible. Because the Bible is never going to contradict itself. It never will. You can count on that. So here we have eight verses, and in the midst of these eight verses, there is a, a one passage that some people pull out, extract, and say, aha, uh -huh, see, it's right there. You can lose your salvation. That is not, hear me, that is not what the author of Hebrews was saying. This author repeatedly throughout this entire book from the first chapter to the, to the last verse in the last chapter is going to use a phrase to describe Christ's sacrifice on Calvary. And, and the phrase that he uses, three words, the phrase, phrase that he uses to describe what Jesus did is once for all. Once for all. Referring to the sacrifice of Christ. Once for all. Well, that means a couple of things. One, it means that it was done one time and could never be repeated. It was so good, so great, so powerful that it would never need to be done again. Secondly, once for all means that the effect of what Christ did on Christ on, on the cross cannot be duplicated and need not be duplicated. It's a one and done offering of himself for our salvation. So to describe what Christ did as once for all and then to turn around and say, but it may not work forever for you would be a contradiction. He's not suggesting that you could lose your salvation. He does boldly state that if one could lose their salvation, if it were possible to walk away, to renounce or to, to have your card uh, jerked from you, it would be impossible to renew them again to repentance. So for those of you who are dabbling with that idea, well, I'm afraid that what I did Saturday night, might, it might be the biggie. I'm afraid that, that where I've been in my life in the last month might be the biggie that might separate me from God and I might have lost my salvation. Let me assure you, if you could lose your salvation, you're going to hell. There's no other option. Because he said clearly it would be impossible to renew you again to repentance. So the logical conclusion then would be, well, I better, I hope I, I hope I don't lose it then. Because I want it when I die. Well, of course you do. You want it to be in effect when you die. Because if your salvation is not in effect when you die, you spend eternity separated from God in a place called hell. He's not suggesting that you can lose it. Because those who claim to have lost their salvation, and I'll go back to the singers and the actors and actresses and just normal folk like you and me, but those who claim to have lost their salvation are denying the efficacy of everything that Christ did on Calvary. They're saying Jesus didn't work on Calvary. They're denying the power of the resurrection. They are, in effect, denying Christ. The author was writing to an audience that included many Jews who were struggling to let go of their deep Judaistic roots and, and having difficulty embracing Christ. They'd come so close but had failed to receive Christ. And for them, so close but no to Jesus. I feel drawn but no, it's not for me. Jesus isn't for me. He was exactly right when he said, if you reject Christ, if you refuse to receive Christ, you have no hope. He's, 
He is the only way. There's no plan B. There's no option number two. He's the way, the truth, and the life. And to reject Him is to reject life. To reject Him is to reject the possibility of salvation for Jesus is the way. And let me interject. I mean, this is not in my notes, but I feel compelled to interject this because some of you are still, oh, you're hung up on works. But Clint, I, I, I don't know. I want to keep it together. I want to be good until I die. But you just never know what's going to happen. No, you don't. But here's the the deal. My salvation and your salvation, my security and your security are not dependent on our ability to keep it together perfectly every day until we die. If that were the case, all of us would go to hell. Every one of us. Our salvation is not dependent upon our ability to hold it together. Our salvation is dependent upon Christ's ability to hold on to us. And the scripture very clearly says, of those whom the Father has placed placed in my care, those who he has put in my hand, I will not lose one of them. Jesus himself said that. I got you. I got you. The, The ad campaign is he gets us. Eh, that's cute. But I'm telling you this morning, he's got us. He's got us, and nothing's going to take us away. Okay, let's take that one step further, and we're going to go to point number three and wind this baby up. A genuine faith will result in a fruitful life. One who's encountered the living Christ and received that gift of eternal life is going to have evidence in their life evidence of Christ. As, as most good Bible writers and the, the teachers in the Bible did, he says, let me give you an illustration. And so he kind of gathers everybody up in their imagination and they go out back and look out at, at the pasture and the garden and the land behind the house. And he said, you see what's out there? Yeah, yeah. You see that place over there that's been tilled and uh, taken care of, prepared, planted, cultivated. You see how beautiful that is, and there's, there's plants, and there's fruit, there's vegetables, and, and it's gorgeous, right? Yeah, yeah. You see over there, that part that's been untended, left to its own devices. You see what you see over there? Yeah. What? Thistles and thorns, right? Yes, thistles and thorns. You see a tomato over there? No. You see a watermelon over there? No. You see any leeks over there? No. You just see thistles and thorns, right? And you don't even want to go in there. Right, right, right. I said, okay. Let's use that as a word picture. For ground that drinks the rain which often falls on it and brings forth vegetation useful to those for whose sake it is also tilled, they receive a blessing from God. Okay. So ground that has been tilled, ground that has been prepared and planted, uh, it, it brings forth fruit. Vegetation useful to those for whose sake it's also tilled, and it receives a blessing from God. Now, there's the other land that also gets rained on. And and here's the deal. For for some uh, unclear reason, and I can't figure it out, uh, for some unclear reason, God, I believe, has chosen to bless the United States of America. The only explanation I have for why we have been so fortunate and, and we have lived in the place that we've lived in and enjoyed the things that we enjoy day in and day out is because God has chosen to bless the United States of America. Now, does that mean that everybody in America is a Christian? No. Does that mean the majority of people in the United States are Christian? Absolutely not. Does it, does it mean that everybody lives an up and up life and even though they're not Christian, God says, well, that'll do, not on your life. But I do, I do believe that there is the presence of God here in this country. I believe that the church is still alive and well in the United States of America. The people of God are still here, at least at this juncture. And I believe that God is choosing to bless His people in this place at this time. And as a result of His blessing of the people of God, those who don't know Him and those who, who reject Him are likewise being blessed. I mean, that, that rain is falling on them. That they're benefiting from the economy. They're benefiting from what order we have. They're benefiting from the government that we have. They are being blessed just like you and I are being blessed. 
So what's the difference, you say? Well, for those who are in Christ, there is a spiritual fruit. There is that evidence of Christ. There is the, the joy of our salvation. There is the peace of God that passes all understanding. There is that ability to discern good and evil. There is that willingness to sacrifice oneself for those around us who, who we may know or not know, who may be in the fellowship or out of the fellowship, but there's just this prompting to be salt and light and to make a difference in the world. And, and that sometimes, it's not always clear on the outside. We look a lot like other people. And then around us, there are those other folk who don't know the Lord. And they got good jobs and they live in big houses and they drive nice cars. And you say, well, Clint, isn't that a sign of God's blessing? Not necessarily. What's absent then? Spiritual fruit. In their lives, there's a, a spiritual barrenness. And their life is all about what they can drive and what they can wear and where they can live. That's all they got. And one day they're going to leave all that behind. And when they leave all that they've got behind, they've got nothing to look forward to. But when you and I in Christ leave what we have behind, it's going to be a hallelujah good time. You say, Clint, I don't understand what you're saying now. I like my stuff. I like my stuff. I like my stuff. But God's blessing and what he's going to reward us with in heaven are going to make this stuff look like pitiful rags and trash. And, and he, he's going to allow us to step into his presence and to enjoy his presence for all eternity. And those who are outside of faith in Christ will be eternally separated from him. So he said, look out there. You got land that's bearing fruit and blessing those whose land it is. And you got land that's covered up with thorns and thistles. And it's not a blessing, it's a curse. And one day it's going to be burned up. One who is in Christ has the presence of Christ and the blessing of Christ. The blessing more at times than others. The joy more at times than others. The peace more at times than others. That's just the way it is. We're all going to have bad days. I mean, I'll tell you, there are some days I don't feel very preacherly. I just don't. And I, in those moments, they don't last long, but in those moments, I'm praying you don't call me. Because I don't want to talk to you. And, and in those moments, my, my feeling, my human feeling is, don't call me and complain about your problems. I got my own problems. And that's the beauty of caller ID. I can see who it is and choose not to answer it. You know, on those days, in those moments, they don't happen very often. Uh, but when I feel preacherly, you know, we're good to go. But I'm glad to know that when I don't feel preacherly, God's still God. My salvation is still my salvation. I'm so glad to know that God is still in me and working in me when I'm not at my best. Because he is who he is. But he's not going to let me stay there. He's not going to let Clint Davis sit down and, and be a horse's patoot. He's not going to allow me to say, I don't feel like it today, God. You go and get somebody else to do what you're doing. He'd say, no, Clint, I called you. Get up off of it, brother. Let's go. And, and, and God, God has a big foot. It's wider than this. I'm telling you. Because I have felt his foot in my behind on more than one occasion. Get up. Quit your whining. Quit belly aching about what they got and what you don't have and what they are doing and what. Shut up. You say, well, God doesn't talk like that. Maybe not to you. He does to me. <laughs> and I get up and I, I remember, God, you are so good. God, you are so great. And thank you for allowing me to be a part of what you're doing. Now, what do we do with this? One, if you're here today and you don't know Christ, and you're satisfied with coming to church once every three months and getting you a little hint of religion, and you think that's going to get you through, consider the thistles and the thorns. That's where you're headed. You're trying your best to do the best you can with what you've got, and it's going to fail you at some point in time. If it hasn't already, Jesus will never fail you. I'm encouraging you to trust Christ to forgive your sin, to give you his eternal life, and to help you get to that place that he created you to be in. 
Maybe you're here as a believer and you've wandered off. It happens. You've wandered off for a season. You, you've never known the Lord to leave you, but you've wandered off and gotten distracted by other things. And it's time for you to come back to that place where you say, okay, Lord, I'm tired of fighting against you. I'm tired of wasting opportunities. I want you to work through me like you want to work through me. And if it's here, so be it. And that might mean you stand with us as a church, become a member of our church. It may be that you've never been baptized by immersion. You'd say, I'm a Christian. I know that clan. I know Jesus saved me, but I've never, I've never stood up for my salvation. I've never stood up with Christ. I want to stand with Christ. I want to stand with this church. I'd like to be baptized to give that testimony of my salvation. Man, it can happen. It can happen. If that's what God's prompting you to do, let's, let's follow God's leadership. Pray with me. Father, thank you for your presence here through this service today and for the truth of your word. And Father, I pray that we've been good stewards of that word and you will take it and apply it. You will use it to draw us and to guide us. I pray that you will bless this invitation and, uh, and just call us to, to walk a little closer with you today. And I ask all this in Jesus' name.